Hello everyone. In this lecture, we continue our journey through cellular injury. We, we have already discussed cellular adaptation, and now it's time to focus on mechanism of cell injury. Cellular injury happens when a cell is severely stressed beyond adaptation, or when it has intrinsic abnormalities of its own in its DNA or protein. This would lead to cellular injury. This can actually be reversible, but if it is severe enough, it, it might end up with cellular death. Now it's essential to look at the outcome of cell injury, and this is a very simplified form uh, of looking at it. First, we start with an injury that is mild or very early. This can be actually reversible, and it would lead to structural and functional abnormalities in the cell itself that could actually go to being normal again. However, if this stimulus is persistent, cellular death could happen and the cell end up with either apoptosis or necrosis, which are the types of cellular death. A cell can go into cellular death right away if it is a very severe injury or late in that particular injury. Before we start, uh, there are two important topics that we need to talk about before going into the mechanism of cell injury. We should start with necrosis and apoptosis just to have a brief understanding of the difference between the two. However, these are going to be discussed in much detail in the third part of this lecture. Okay, And then in the next slide, we're going to talk about the causes of cellular injury because we need to answer the question why cell injury happens before we understand how. So necrosis and apoptosis. This is a very brief explanation. This is the pathway of necrosis and it starts with severe membrane damage. And when we talk about membranes, we also include those inside the cell, including the uh, membranes that line the lysosomes. And we know that lysosomes contain digestive enzymes inside of them. So when we have mem membrane damage, you're going to have leakage of those enzymes into the cell. Cell digestion, leakage of cellular content into the extracellular space and the cell does not only die but it also creates inflammation around it and there are types of injuries that lead to necrosis like ischemia exposure to toxins various infections and trauma and necrosis is always pathological there is another physiological way of dying which is apoptosis we call it sometimes programmed cell death and it starts with nuclear dissolution. Cellular fragmentation will be followed by a release of apoptotic bodies. And as you can see here, the cell membrane is partially intact and there is no inflammation around it because the, the, the membranes are still holding the cellular components and it actually ends with phagocytosis, so it's a very clean process. The causes of apoptosis include uh, deprivation of cofactors or a damage in DNA of proteins that is beyond repair. The cell itself actually triggers its own death because of its damaged DNA, okay? So what are the causes of cell injury? Um, there are many causes, of course, we're going to talk about eight of them. The first one is hypoxia, which is, that is actually oxygen deficiency. Ischemia is a very important cause of hypoxia. Imagine that this cell is being supplied by this artery and drained uh, from blood by this vein. Whenever you have a block in this artery, for whatever reason, uh, the cell would have less oxygen to consume and produce energy, and it's going to undergo hypoxia. Same goes for venous drainage. If this uh, venous drainage is occluded, for example, the blood stagnation in this area would allow the cell to consume the oxygen in it for a while, uh, but after that, when all the oxygen is consumed, the cell would uh, definitely undergo hypoxia. Another cause of hypoxia is blood loss anemia. You know that blood contains hemoglobin, and hemoglobin is the, the principal oxygen-carrying compound in our body, and when you lose a lot of blood, you lose a lot of hemoglobin, and thus the oxygen carrying capacity will decrease in, and your cells might undergo hypoxia. The third example is carbon monoxide poisoning. This is a hemoglobin protein and it carries uh, along with the oxygen as you can see here. 
when you inhale a lot of carbon monoxide, it has a high affinity for hemoglobin and it binds to it, replacing the oxygen. And when you have most of your hemoglobin carrying carbon monoxide instead of oxygen, your cells would have a, lot, a hard time producing energy without that oxygen and would undergo hypoxia. Lastly, decreased oxygenation, which is when you have fresh blood that you want to uh, provide with oxygen, and these are mainly related to the respiratory system, and the causes are many. Okay, so we're done with hypoxia. Second cause of cell injury is chemical agents. Um, they include a lot of things, and they actually cause injury due to several reasons, including the altering of membrane permeability of the cell, they can change the integrity of an enzyme or a cofactor, and they could also alter the osmotic hemostasis in the cell. And there are certain chemicals that we consume on a, on a daily basis that are considered normal. When these are ingested in excess, they can be dangerous, like water and salt, glucose and oxygen. Other causes include infectious agents, such as bacteria or viruses, immunological reactions, including autoimmune reactions, which is when your own immune system attacks your own cells, and allergic reactions, like when you have antibodies against an allergen and they create a whole mess of inflammation and it actually harms your own cells. Genetic factors can play a major role in cell injury, especially the deficiency of functional proteins or accumulation of damaged DNA. They could lead to apoptosis. Nutritional imbalances, um, such as protein calorie insufficiency or vitamin deficiencies. Aging is another cause of cell injury. And how does aging injure your cells? Aging actually causes an alteration in replicative and repair abilities of your cell. Lastly, physical agents, which what happens when you physically harm your cell. That could happen with a lot of causes like temperature, parasites, and so on and so forth. Now, this is very basic. You have an injurious stimulus that would lead to a cellular response. And there are many factors that play a role in this process. As you can see here, the type of the injury, the severity. For example, if you have a low dose of a toxin versus a larger dose of the toxin. Duration is important, especially in terms of ischemia, when you have a brief interval of ischemia versus a longer interval. And same goes for cellular response. It depends on, on, on many things, starting with the cell type, like when you, you have two cell types subjected to the same amount of hypoxia, let's say. If you're hypoxic, your cardiac muscles are going to get injured faster than your striated muscles. Uh, the status of your uh, cell is also important, like how much glycogen is in that cell. For example, when you compare between your brain cell and a, and a liver cell, you know that liver cells have an abundance of glycogen in them. When a body becomes hypoxic, the brain is damaged way faster than the liver. And lastly, genetics, they, they have a huge role in cellular response. For example, if you have two people who drank the same toxin, they could have like different cellular responses depending on their metabolism of that particular toxin, which is influenced by their genetics. Now, the principal biochemical mechanisms. You can see that these are a lot. This is the main bulk of the lecture. And we have six principles. We're going to talk about them individually. But you need to understand that these are very, very complex. I didn't say hard to understand, but very, very complex. So you need to focus on how each one of these principles affect the other. I would recommend that you pause the video right here and read these titles individually before we go through them. So we start with ATB depletion. We should understand the pathways of ATB production before we talk about its depletion. And this is very, very simplified. You have your circulation. If there is oxygen available, you're going to reduce that oxygen. Oxidative phosphorylation of ADB would lead to ATP release. If you don't have oxygen, you're going to go with glucose and start anaerobic glycolysis and produce ATP. Anaerobic glycolysis produces a lot of lactic acid. So the question is what happens when oxygen is lost? Three things happen when oxygen is lost, and I, I broke them down this way just to make it easier. First, all the ATB dependent bumps would stop working, and we have two of them here. This is the sodium potassium bump, and this is the calcium bump. Okay, so the sodium bump keeps 
sodium outside and potassium inside against the, the natural gradient. Whenever you have ATP depletion, your sodium is going to stay inside your cell and it always drags water with it. So we're going to end up with cellular swelling. Now the calcium pump keeps calcium outside the cell. If it stops working, it would cause cellular damage on its own. There, there's a whole slide on how calcium causes cellular damage. Secondly, the anaerobic glycolysis. And I have already said that when you have oxygen deficiency, you're going to go into this pathway. This would increase your lactic acid, which will drop your pH and would cause enzyme dysfunction. Lastly is the detachment of ribosomes from the rough endoplasmic reticulum. They wouldn't really produce much protein for a net results of ATP depletion. Now we're done with the first principle. The second is calcium influx. You have your extracellular calcium right here going into your, inside your cell and would lead to several results. Most important of which is the activation of cellular enzymes. Phospholipase would degrade phospholipids. Why are phospholipids important? They are an integral part of the cell membrane. You know that your cell membrane is made of protein and phospholipids. Proteases would degrade all the proteins in your uh, membranes and cytoskeletal system. And all of these would have a net result of membrane damage. Endonuclease would cause a nuclear damage and ATBAs would cause depletion in your ATB. So you have like, this is the net result of calcium influx. Another way that calcium influx affects ATB is that it directly affects the permeability of the mitochondrial membrane. Uh, keep in mind that this is principle number five. We're going to talk about this in a few slides. The third principle is mitochondrial dysfunction. So when this is your mitochondria and when, whenever this is disturbed, you wouldn't, you would have ATV depletion. Also, it is going to cause a raise in your reactive oxygen species. We're going to talk about these in the next slide. And lastly, mitochondrial dysfunction would cause activation of apoptosis. And we already talked about apoptosis. Oxidative stress. It is something caused by reactive oxygen species. These are free radicals. This is a free radical. It's an atom that is missing one electron and it becomes really, really unstable and tries to take an electron from another healthy atom. The atoms in nucleic acids, cellular proteins, and even lipids, they themselves convert into another type of free radical and, and it starts a chain of damage. Okay, so we have like a number of questions. The first one, why do we have the, those free radicals? These are produced by your mitochondria, and th this is a list of their names. Superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, reactive hydroxide radical, and nitric oxide. Why are these important, and why do your mitochondria produce them? These are needed for phagocytosis. Your phagocytic leukocytes, or, or your white blood cells, use the free radicals as weapons for destroying ingested microbes and other substances. And your body has something that we call a scavenging system that would control these free radicals. But what happens when you have an excess of these free radicals and your scavenging system is not able to, to control them any longer? You're going to end up with oxidative stress. Okay? Question number two. What would increase the free radicals? Radiant energy like ultraviolet rays, metabolism of certain chemicals, and inflammation, which is produced by your white blood cells. I have already said that white blood cells use free radicals to eliminate microbes. Sometimes when they do this, they harm the normal healthy cells around them. Question 3. How do free radicals cause cell injury? There are three ways in which they would injure your cells. Lipid peroxidation, which is they, they attack the membranes of your cells that contain lipid and they peroxidate those lipids. And the lipid radical interaction would actually yield peroxides, which are unstable themselves. Secondly, they would cause protein cross-linking. In simple words, is when you have a number of proteins glued together and when they are glued together, they are not able to work anymore. In scientific words, it is going to result in enhanced degradation or loss of enzymatic activity. And lastly, thiamine damage. Thiamine is a, an integral part of DNA, so your free radicals attack your DNA and destroy it.
Last question. What inactivates free radicals? We talked about the scavenging system, which is basically composed of enzymes and antioxidants. This is an example of a cool antioxidant, which is offering the unstable free radical one electron, so it would stop being unstable. And these include certain vitamins like vitamin A, vitamin C, and vitamin E. And some enzymes in your body like superoxide dismutase, glutathione superoxidase, and catalase. Okay, membrane permeability defects, which is uh, principle number five. Uh, I have already told you that you need to remember this when we talked about calcium influx. When we talk about cellular membranes, we talk about three important ones, uh, which are the mitochondrial membrane, the plasma membrane, and the lysosomal membrane. When the permeability of the mitochondrial membrane is defective, you're going to have less ATP production. Secondly, when you have the permeability of your plasma membrane defective, things will go out and things will go in. You would have influx of ions followed by fluids and you're going to have a leakage of your cell cellular components. And lastly, lysosomal membrane, when it breaks down, it is going to release all of the enzymes inside like ribonucleases, DNases, and other enzymes. And you're going to end up with necrosis. Now I want to show you how these principles are really connected to each other and so complex that they actually affect one another. In this context, we're going to talk about all of the previous principles affecting only the membranes. And keep in mind, when I say the word membrane, I'm talking about lipids and proteins, okay? First, if you have ATP depletion, one of the net results would be less protein synthesis. And if you have less protein synthesis, you would definitely have defective membranes. Secondly, if you have influx of calcium, you can actually see that there are two important things here. Phospholipase would degrade your lipid and proteases that would definitely damage your membrane. And lastly, the oxidative stress that would attack your lipids and cause, cause your proteins to be defective. The last principle is the damage to DNA and proteins. If damage to DNA is too severe to be corrected, or if there is an increase in improperly folded proteins, the cell would initiate its suicide program and dies by apoptosis. This concludes the mechanism of cell injury lecture.